All right. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today we are going to um, start looking at the historic period. And, um, you know, we start with uh, Mesopotamia. Um, so this place, um, so we should have been already um, familiarized with the region. Uh, we mentioned the fertile crescent, and fertile crescent um, is very close to Mesopotamia. It includes northern part of Mesopotamia. So we know from the Neolithic period um, near this region, a region called the fertile crescent, um, had yielded uh, huge structures, um, human settlement. So this is the, the early phase where um, the uh, civilizations developed. The area known as Mesopotamia refer to the region um, <clears throat> between two great rivers. And these are the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. Both of them primarily in today's country of Iraq and they originated in the mountainous area um, in southern Turkey, in the ancient Anatolia, <clears throat> and flow into the Persian Gulf. So these two great rivers um, was the um, birthplace for the first group of cities and the city states. Um, it is just the first one of a series of great river civilizations. And these civilizations of great rivers include here Mesopotamia that we are going to cover today and include slightly later, a couple centuries later, civilizations start to emerge in along the Nile River that is in ancient Egypt. And then after a couple centuries, civilization started to um, flourish along another great river, the, the Indus and the Ganges River, which is in South Asia, in India and Pakistan. And then a few centuries later, another great civilization rose along the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, and that is in China, right? So these four great civilizations the uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, and China are referred to as the great river civilizations. And there are historians and theorists who had developed theories about the beginning of civilization. One of, the, one of them is Wittfogel's hydraulic theory of oriental despotism. Carl Wittfogel, a German-American historian of the 20th century argued that state organization first emerged in arid regions to control large-scale hydraulic network for irrigation, drainage, and flood control. He believed that the complexity involved in these systems led to the rise of bureaucratic states in arid river valley environment such as Mesopotamia. And um, he also argued that the beginning of civilization started with the control of flood and irrigation and that which need centralized power. So he argued that this centralized power over, over water result in the despotic character of these early states. So we know in all these regions kind of um, uh, some kind of um, aristocratic and um, um, kind of autocratic um, bureaucracy devel developed. Um, <clears throat> and um, kind of a, on the same line, um, Ferdinand Brondel developed his theory about uniformity and diversity, while Wittfogel defined those early 
great river civilizations as the origin of um, kind of auto autocracy of government. Um, Brondell argued that you know there are different type of civilization emerging in a different kind of uh, geo geographical um, regions. <clears throat> Um, so he agreed with Wittfogel that centralized governments and urban clusters first appear in areas of geographical uniformity, such as the alluvial plains of Mesopotamia. Um, but he also observed that geographical diversity of mountain regions um, leads to decentralized society seen in early Greek history or in Persia. So his argument is basically, while there are um, autocratic regime developing in the great river civilization, on the other hand, democracy emerged in those diversified um, geographical regions, such as in Greece, which has a lot of mountains and waters divided those um, land into small pieces, um, isolated pieces, or in, in Persia. So he made a kind of a dichotomy of democracy versus um, authoritarian uh, geographical diversity versus kind of a um, geographical um, consistency um, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the river. So his theory basically um, helped to develop the, the idea of uh, also helped to kind of glorify Greece as the origin of democracy and uh, to which Western civilization would like to identify themselves with. Um, so I'm obviously I'm presenting these theories to you as some kind of a scholarly debate. I'm not um, presenting as something that I subscribe to, um, as you, you know by now from the way I, I teach the material. So um, I'm presenting some kind of influential theories, not necessarily um, mean that I agree with these theory or not. Actually, I'm going to present something. Can I ask? Do you mind? Contradictory to, to this. The theory of Orientalism by Edward Said um, was meant to explain why certain history were being eulogized and why certain history had been explained to um, legitimize um, the Western um, hegemony. So he said in his very famous um, book, Orientalism, he said he defined Orientalism as the corporate institution of dealing with the Orient, uh, dealing with it by making statements about it, authorizing views of it, describing it by teaching it, settling it, uh, ruling over it. In short, he said, Orientalism is a Western style for dominating, uh, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. So um, the theory, Said's theory is very influential in literary uh, critique, um, in um, you know, art critique. So, um, <clears throat> So for him, uh, Brondell and Wittfogel, their theories is a, um, an expression of this Orientalism. The made statement about the Orient and as a way to define the um, kind of Western dominance, uh, creating a narrative about uh, to justify um, the hegemony of, West, of the West um, over the so-called Orient. Uh, in fact, there's no singular Orient at all. Um, 
the so-called East um, was very diversified. They had very different cultures and very different historical path that they arrived at the um, current condition. Um, so the Mesopotamia was the classical Orient. You know, when we use these words, so now I would like to put them in quotation mark um, because we are uh, kind of challenging such ideas. Because it is the um, closest other to Western European civilization. You know, the other is another major concept, concept in Said's uh, Orientalism. So basically, in order to define yourself, you define the opposite that is called other. And uh, the other um, are all negative. So that, um, the self being defined is all positive. So this is the politics of Orientalism. So the Orient, um, the big other of Western civilization, had long been the, um, uh, the Mesopotamia. Um, Mesopotamia had long history. It has its own civilization that is somehow connected with, uh, in some way connected with the Western European civilization, but also different enough to allow them to construct a big other um, for the narrative to, um, to grant um, power to the Western civilization. Now, um, the history covered in today's lecture is, is very long and um, obviously we, we cannot um, get into all, all these details, but a few things I wanted to point out here, I think that's quite enough. It's some turning point um, in the Mesopotamian civilization. One turning, turning point is somewhere you know, around 3000 BCE. Um, around 3000 BCE, before that, um, in Mesopotamia, those cities um, are pretty much independent. They are self-sufficient city states. And after 3000 BCE, um, some states um, became uh, super powerful and they started to exert uh, control over neighboring states and created some kind of dynastic um, uh, rulership. So there appeared, um, you know, king of kings or the first among equal kings. Um, some league of independent city states developed. Um, some of the famous cities like Ur, like Uruk, those um, had been um, the leader of the, of the league and the, their kings had greater power than the king of other city states. So that's one of the um, turning point. And um, <clears throat> um, one of the, so those states, um, they were collective, collectively know, known as the Sumerians. So they, they are pretty much in today's Southern Iraq in, in, in these regions. And this region, um, uh, also used to be uh, adjacent to, to water. The coastline had extended further into the sea, but some of these cities um, 5,000 years ago was kind of coastal city. They are uh, just by the water. So the deposits from the rivers created more land and today they are uh, inland cities, but 5,000 years ago, a lot of them are on the coast. Um, so, one of the uh, Sumerian state um, known as the, the Akkadian, um, the Akkadians under a great king known as Sargon the Great. Um, this is the first Sargon. There were a lot of kings, later kings um, also called themselves Sargon. So we have Sargon the second, Sargon the third, but Sargon, um, the Great was a Arcadian ruler who for the, for the first time kind of created a Sumerian empire or the Arcadian empire um, out of the Sumerian tribes. 
who kind of unified those states. And those states were pretty much in this orange area. It was kind of unified under Sargon. So, um, and that was in the middle of the third millennium BCE. Then toward the end of the Sumerian, um, uh, toward the end of the third uh, millennium BCE, the so-called third Sumerian dynasty founded by Ur Namu. And this time it was under um, the leadership of the city-state of Ur, uh, previously uh, kind of conquered by the Akkadians um, by Sargon, and now revived um, around 2100 BCE. So um, Ur Namu uh, kind of founded the Ur dynasty, um, or sometimes known as the third Sumerian dynasty, or the uh, third um, Ur dynasty. So known in multiple names, but it referred to the same kind of um, unification under Ur Namu. So um, with greater unification, control of greater resource and territory, huge architecture were constructed under uh, Ur Namu's reign, um, the great ziggurat um, in the city of Ur was constructed. And that is one of the major monuments we are going to look at. And that is from around uh, 2100 BCE, uh, the ziggurat of Ur. So put it into the historical background. It is a monument after the unification of the third Sumerian dynasty. Um, around 1800 BCE, the Babylonians who were originally in the um, kind of peripheral, um, the Babylonians who lived not in the heartland of the Sumerian civilization, but lived on the uh, Western border. Um, they were probably not as um, advanced in culture as the Sumerian states like Ur, Uruk, um, Lagath, uh, etc. but they were kind of militarily more powerful. And uh, um, they conquered um, the Sumerian region and established the old Babylonian empire. And um, it is during the old Babylonian period in the early part of the second millennium that gradually the king's authority ascend above the temple. So before that, the priests had greater authority over the population and uh, the kings were like some, something like the servant um, to the temple. But during the um, old Babylonian period, the, um, the kings, sometimes start to adopt the title as the high priest and even um, fashion them as the representative of God. So situation started to change in the second millennium BCE. In the mid second millennium BCE, around 1400 BCE, another great neighbor, militarily more powerful, um, came from the north and this time it is Assyrians. So the Assyrians originally lived in this area. It's not quote unquote, um, the cradle of civilization anymore. It is in the upper Tigris river. So the Assyrians um, founded great cities of Nimrod and Khorsabad in the north and eventually also conquered the Mesopotamian region and founded the Assyrian empire and the Assyrian Empire emphasized military expansion. And we started to see a very different kind of urbanism and architecture under the Assyrian um, Empire in the mid second century BCE, uh, uh, mid, mid second millennia BCE. And um, around 1500 BCE, this is also the kind of imperialist, imperialistic period in ancient Near East, you know, refer to Mesopotamia, Egypt, etc. So around this time, the Egyptian civilization had passed 
the old kingdom and the middle kingdom and started the new kingdom period and new kingdom Egypt was also kind of imperialistic. Um, the, the pharaoh of Egypt also expand. So the two great power of Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt actually um, struggled in today's Palestine um, in the known as the ancient Levant, um, the Eastern Mediterranean region. So they had battles there. Um, so this, this age, the um, kind of a military um, culture um, rise uh, and created a new type of um, urbanism and architectural uh, environment. So we will take a look at some example from this period. Um, <clears throat> Around the um, seventh century BCE, um, the Babylonians previously conquered by the Assyrians and um, uh, revived and founded the so-called Neo-Babylonian Empire. And this Neo-Babylonian Empire was um, recorded in the, um, in the Old Testament of Bible. So this is, it, it, it has it's a, the king of the um, Neo-Babylonians, um, like Nebuchadnezzar um, was kind of a um, part of the biblical history um, as well. So um, it is under, during the Neo-Babylonian period, the Hebrews were um, the captivity of Hebrews. So that happened during, during this period and also um, the destruction and burning of the um, of the, uh, the temple, um, Solomon's temple um, was also around this period. So this is a Babylonian revival and uh, um, by this time started to control not only Mesopotamian region, but also the previous Assyrian region as well. And then finally, another powerful neighbor from the East, that is the Persians, came to unify everything um, before and, um, you know, controlled not only the Mesopotamia, but also Egypt, Anatolia, and went into conflict uh, with the, the Greek city-states. And the story will pass on when we start looking at the Greek architecture, uh, one of the great monuments of Greek architecture, the Parthenon, of Acropolis was constructed to celebrate the victory, the Greek victory over the Persian uh, invasion. And that happened in the early fifth century BCE to mid fifth century BCE. That was, you know, after the Persian unified almost everything of the known world to the West and start um, invading Greece. So their history was quite intertwined, as you can see, um, why the ancient Mesopotamia was a, a ideal other of the West, because their history was inter, intertwined. Um, you know, China and India was too far away back then, but um, this region is closely related and uh, it, it provided the um, um, a opposite or pictured as an opposite image image for the Western civilization. So a really long historical period, but why um, can we put them in one lecture and cover them um, as, as you know, one um, macro civilization? It is because there were a lot of consistency in the historical development over these kind of 3,000 a year history. Um, <clears throat> until the time of Alexander the Great in, in the fourth century BCE, Mesopotamia had maintained a long continuous history that is characterized by a consistent writing system, a consistent kind of ceremonial uh, festival um, featuring 
um, architecture of the same similar type, it is also uh, quite consistent in terms of the um, bureaucratic system with the authorization of cylindrical uh, seal carved in half stone, etc. So these cultural features had been maintaining the cultural identity of ancient Mesopotamia for over 3000 years until the Alexander conquest. And uh, then later, after a few centuries more, the Romans made it a Roman uh, province. And by that time, it started kind of Hellenization and Romanization. Then we, we might be able to say that ancient Mesopotamian civilization was ended uh, somehow at that point. But before that, we can observe is quite consistently the writing system had been very consistent. In Mesopotamia, they used cuneiform script. Um, that is kind of a small <clears throat> triangular um, stroke carved into clay. And they also use the clay as a writing, writing medium. So basically, you, you, you carve uh, into the clay plate uh, to uh, keep record. So that has been writing system, um, had been quite consistent over three, these 3,000 year history. And um, um, they also had a religious system that featured patron deity of each uh, independent city. So each city had a patron deity and that, that god or goddess was the, like the master of the city um, the true owner of the city. Um, and in the beginning, even the king was servant to this god and the goddesses. And the way they worship their deity was using those monumental platforms, one on top of the other, to elevate the house of their god and the goddesses to the um, high ground to, um, to worship them. And um, this monument is known as Ziggurat, right? So Ziggurat is a um, Mesopotamian monument that features kind of platform above platform. And on top of those uh, stacked platform is the temple. And that temple is usually dedicated to the patron deity uh, um, for, for each um, independent city. So that has been quite consistent. We saw that in the beginning of Mesopotamian civilization. We also see it um, in the um, um, Neo-Babylonian period and even in the Persepolis in the Persian capital, we can observe that some architecture was acted with that kind of um, platform format in mind. And the last one um, is the use of seal um, to, to indicate ownership or authorship. Um, so it was used to seal rooms, uh, merchandise, or a contract. It was instrumental to long distance commerce, man management of private property, and state bureaucratic authority. Without such an authorization system and a consistent writing system, consistent kind of worshiping system, um, such a large territory uh, would not be held together for so long a time. And uh, these seals for authorization also made the long distance trading possible, which helped to create a consistent uh, cultural identity among different uh, independent city states. So um, early cities, appeared in Mesopotamia, you know, as early as 3000 um, BCE, 3500 BCE, there were already traces of large settlement. And the city states appear um, because of different reasons. Um, and there are different theories for the rise of cities in Mesopotamia. And um, so I'm, I'm not going to read each and every um, of these items, but I do want to point out that different cities might, might be created in different ways. Some of them might be created due to defense uh, purposes. And um, 
another city um, might be founded because it is located at a, a strategic location on a trade route. And as a result, um, people congregated there and um, it became flourished um, as a trading center. And uh, yet another place might, you know, became concentrated with population due to some kind of miraculous event and um, the kind of a, 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 which lead them to become the ritual center. And there were also administration center created uh, purposefully by those great rulers um, that um, to, to, for the purpose of controlling population and also um, easy access to different resources. And there is also social um, background for the creation of cities um, that kind of uh, helped to um, gather people of different, different, um, different profession together um, for kind of more uh, efficient um, social uh, connection and com communication. So the, <clears throat> um, excuse me. You know, we might ask what precisely is the definition of a city? You know, we have seen large settlement in the Neolithic period, um, but we didn't call them city. So what make a settlement a city? City by de definition is not self-sufficient. So that's basically a, a basic definition of city. City is different from a large agricultural settlement because a large settlement due to agriculture for a farming uh, community, they were self-sufficient. They didn't rely on exchange. Uh, they produced their own food um, and um, they can, they are self-sufficient. So that is not a city. By definition, city is a place that you have different trades going on. Um, you have a collection of different, um, different workers, um, different professions, and they help each other. Um, and they also um, do whatever they were uh, good at. So a city is more efficient because people were specialized. So city is a product of um, social uh, stratification. You know, there were professionalization among the population and um, uh, some people were specialized in something and they were, they were good at doing something and they can focus on doing something to perfect it. And uh, as a result, you know, they don't have to produce their own food. They don't need to produce their own tools that they were not good at to produce. They can make something really good and they can exchange it with, with whatever, whatever they need with someone else. So city is um, the appearance of city basically indicate a high level of social development. And um, um, that's why, you know, here kind of none of them mentioned agriculture. Um, none of these uh, theory about the rise of city would say, you know, this, a city appeared because it's, it's, it's a piece of land that is good at producing rice or, or something. Um, so city by definition is not self-sufficient it is an indicator of sophisticated social organization. And that first appeared in the ancient Mesopotamian region. So each of those city states usually controlled, controlled a large rural area um, for which it rely, upon which it rely uh, for its food product, but the city itself do not, do not produce food. Um, it is specialized in something else. So each, each of those cities um, 
had a had a ziggurat dedicated to um, their to their um, patron patron deity. The ziggurat, which means to build a raised area, um, is the outcome of successive rebuilding of temple platform. So here, ziggurat, a new ziggurat is constructed not to erase the old one, but rather to, to make the old temple part of the new base and then build the new building on top of that. This, this somehow sounds familiar, right? We have, we have um, you know, noticed something in the Neolithic age. Anyone remember you know, which Neolithic um, example we, we, we discussed that has the same, same similar fashion of expansion and a renewal? Anyone remember? Katal Hayak. Katal Huyuk. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, Katal, Katal Huyuk was like that. Um, it is in today's Turkey, in the Anatolian region, north to the north of the, um, the Mesopotamia. It, it also belonged to, you know, part of the um, fertile crescent. And uh, there, you know, new houses were built on top of the old one. So here, the ziggurats were constructed in the same fashion. Basically, um, for those flourishing cities, the ziggurat became bigger and bigger because the newer one always wrapped the old, older one uh, inside and uh, kind of kept expanding in that fashion. Some of those, those ziggurats, like um, in the city of Uruk, um, archaeologists has discovered as many as 20 layers. So there were at least 20 expansion and uh, resulted in a, um, in a big monument. Uruk, by the way, is the origin of the name of Iraq, um, the, the modern country of Iraq. Uh, kind of was connected uh, with the ancient city-state of of Uruk. So um, during the Sumerian period of you know, 3000 BCE, 2000 BCE, before, before that, these um, ziggurats were used for great festivals, um, especially the New Year's festival. So during the New Year festival, um, Tammuz, the god of food is mourned and then resurrected and married with the goddess mother and thus ensuring nature's fertility. So this also sounds familiar. Uh, seems that the relig religion of Mes ancient Mesopotamia um, had, a, had a close connection with those Neolithic cultures because the fertility and the marriage um, between god and the goddess to ensure fertility was um, one of the, uh, the key um, religious practice um, among those Neolithic cultures in the, in the region. So as a result, the ziggurat symbolized a cosmic marriage bed, an offering table of heaven or the ladder to heaven. So that's the, it's like the, 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 the marriage um, place for those god and goddess and their marriage would um, ensure the fertility on earth. And it is also, um, of course, celebrated during the time of the renewal. And these also tied to the Neolithic architecture that featured the um, celebrating crucial moment um, in the definition of seasons. Uh, for example, you know, the, uh, the winter solstice uh, there are those turning point in the uh, orbit of the earth around the sun. So those festivals were, were also celebrated um, to renew a year, hoping for a, you know, a fruitful, um, hoping for a good year uh, in, the, in the coming season. So the, um, the Uruk ziggurat um, is accessed by priests and kings um, for the performance of those annual rituals of renewal uh, to placate the gods 
and guarantee fertility and pros prosperity for the city. Um, so over millennia, you know, from the from the um, uh, Uruk ziggurat um, to the Ur ziggurat um, around the um, you know 2000 BCE. This this one is around 3000 BCE, and then um, down to the Assyrian period. So the same kind of um, form of ziggurat were constructed. Um, during the Sumerian period, uh, before 2000 BCE, the relationship between the ruler and the priests were, um, you know, both of them were servant to, to the patron god of the city. This is a statue um, of a king whose name is Gudea. And um, the statue featured the king holding his hand in the gesture of worship. And on his lap, um, there is a plate. And on the plate, there is a plan of a temple. And this is um, a plan of a temple for the moon moon god um, and um, um, so uh, I'm sorry the the the, um, the god of the city um, um, the, the, the god known as Ningersu so um, dedicated to the patron god and then on the apron there were inscriptions and a, a, a translation of that quote, quotation shows that um, the, the message was announced uh, from the mouth of the, of the god uh, to command the king to build a house for the god. So this is a, uh, a, a passage from that inscription. Um, it is commanding the king uh, to, to serve the god by constructing um, a temple for the god. Um, so if he, if he do it, um, God told him that your kingdom is going to flourish. Um, all the great fields will bear for thee. Dikes and canal will swell for thee. I have so, a question. Yes. Um, so if the, if the kings built the temples, are they commanding themselves when they're writing the inscriptions? Um, that's a great question. You know, I think the the message must come from the priest, um, priest caste. So these, these are like two groups of elite. The king um, and did an administration, and then there were also priests who um, served serve the god. And sometimes they, were, they would uh, speak, um, you know, representing the god and, 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 and say something and commanding the king to do this and, and to do that. And by that performing much. that, the king also kind of elevated their own status because they were performing, you know, fulfilling their, their duty. So I yeah, don't think so. the king did that. Like, I think that the priests were probably at an even higher social status than the kings then. Because the kings are afraid of the gods. And if the priests can say or translate the gods' words to the kings, they basically command governments. That's, you know, I, um, I think I agree with that. Um, I would agree uh, with that. You know, at that time, at least the king was not above the priest. They are, you know, they, they probably had a different powers. You know, the priest, the priest has religious power and uh, the king had uh, administrative power, but obviously sometimes, you know, um, the priest uh, can, um, command the king to do this and, and, and do that. So back then from what we, uh, we can read here, that seems like the case. So uh, that's a good question. Um, and I think your interpretation um, is correct. So, so here we have um, one of, you know, the early example of those ziggurat um, from before 3000 BCE. Um, it has as many as 20 layers. It had a white temple on top of the ziggurat. Um, the ziggurat is 
asymmetrical, probably due to the um, constant reconstruction. Um, it is not oriented toward any cardinal direction, but interestingly, it is um, the main axis, main stair staircase is pointing to southeast, um, somewhat um, similar to the direction of a Neolithic monument that we looked at last time. Anyone remember the, uh, the orientation of the orienting to southeast, uh, which one? The, the passage tomb, right? The passage tomb at New Grand. So at the passage tomb oriented toward the winter solstice. So here um, it is not exactly as exact as the uh, New Grand passage tomb, but it is also oriented toward the southeast and it is roughly aligned with the sunshine of the winter solstice. Um, shows kind of the uh, time measuring um, function um, of this great monument. Um, so a few things that worth pointing out. Uh, one is it is in these monumental um, architecture, buttresses were used to highlight the surface. So the, uh, um, the platform was basically constructed with mud brick. Um, it's, it's all mud brick with only the stair and um, the, the top surfaces paved with, um, with stone. Um, <clears throat> so the wall itself um, would become um, monotonous um, otherwise. And indeed, most of the residential uh, buildings excavated are uh, monotonous. But here, this kind of buttresses um, created uh, those patterns along the wall and uh, under the sunshine, they create interesting patterns and helped to elevate the image of these, um, these ziggurat. Um, and with the um, white temple on top, the temple itself was constructed with a kind of um, limestone, white limestone, and those white limestone, according to a uh, record, um, it shine and uh, under the sunshine and could and is visible uh, from many miles away. Uh, so there is a shining building. Of course, today, um, the white temple, uh, the white temple is no longer there. There's only the foundation that allows archaeologists to, re to reconstruct its plan. But from the record, we know that building was covered by white limestone and those white limestone sh shine under sunshine and um, um, for uh, ancient Mesopotamian, uh, ancient Sumerians, that is the very symbol of, of the existence of God. Um, that huge building, white temple visible from miles away. Um, <clears throat> there are other decoration. So the architectural material in Mesopotamia are mainly mud brick. So as a result, um, the base of the um, building need to be um, insulated uh, in some way uh, to protect them from water. So one way to do that is um, use uh, bitumen um, that those natural um, bitumen, um, you know, the region today is still the main kind of a, a oil, uh, the main source of the, uh, the oil of uh, uh, kind of a, um, supplying the entire world. And in the ancient time, um, those oil uh, didn't mean much for them, um, but the bitumen uh, from those those oil was useful because if you put it on the surface, um, the surface is kind of um, waterproof, became waterproof. So they use bitumen. Um, they also use tile. Um, those clay, after burning, um, they became waterproof and they created those uh, pin-like tile, um, the conical form 
that could be inserted into the uh, surface of the mud brick and um, uh, thus to pr protect the, the surface uh, from water. The way they made the, those tiles is, is interesting. The tiles were created in different colors and uh, they uh, form the pattern and those pattern often shows the, um, um, the features of, uh, of weaving or kind of basketry uh, patterns. So probably they were, uh, the, the pattern themselves were inspired um, by the craft of uh, weaving or the making of, of basket. So they were usually just cover the bottom of each of each layers, uh, those areas that was um, uh, easily, you know, damped by um, water damage. So only this kind of religious architecture got those treatment. Um, the and um, um, the buildings for common folks were usually just to use those undecorated um, mud bricks. The next example, I wanted to show you the uh, two things, point out two things for uh, the e e example from the, um, the oval temple of Kapashe, which is from about 3000 BCE to 2500 BCE. Uh, the, the city is to the east of the Tigris River. Um, <clears throat> different from the Uruk ziggurat, this one, we got a symmetrical form. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. It seems like ziggurat were constructed with greater and greater regularity. Um, the previous asymmetrical form now was replaced by a symmetrical form. The basic idea was the same. So we have um, three steps of platforms. Um, there's a lower platform in the oval shape and then there's a middle platform and they're also in the oval shape. And then there is a inner platform, which is in square. And on top of that platform is the temple dedicated to, to God. So one difference is the symmetry. Now all the platforms are kind of concentric, uh, one inside of the other, and they were organized by a central kind of axis. Uh, connecting all of the three layers. And secondly, um, it got walls to enclose each layer. It's not just open platform anymore. Um, so at Kafache, um, each layer got its own wall and attached to those wall are um, rooms uh, for, for, for different business. So this leads to the third point I want to make, that the temples in ancient Mesopotamian city-states are not just temple. It is the center of everything. It's the headquarter. It is a spiritual headquarter, but it is also the administrative headquarter. It is also the business economic center because here there are shops. There were also uh, workshops there were also storage for the distribution of food. Um, so the temple controlled the, um, the economy and it is also um, uh, very often uh, connected with administration. So those, those rooms were, some of them are storage um, so that um, the kind of a, the temple is also the economic redistribution center. So when we look at something as old as the Mesopotamia, um, like what we mentioned last time in the, for the Neolithic architecture, um, those typology didn't quite work. You cannot cut a religious center um, definitively away from economic center. So they are quite intertwined with one another. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the urban fabric, the contrast between the temple complex and the rest of the city is huge. The rest of the city is quite chaotic, quite organic, 
while the temple complex imposed its great geometry, its great kind of unity into the urban fabric. And it is a sacred realm, but it is also crucial for as a, um, a redistributive redistrib center for the urban life of the city. Um, it is a sacred ground. The ground was specially prepared for the construction of these temples. For example, here, document uh, uh, said that 20 feet of earth was dug and replaced with clean desert sand to purify the land for the construction of, of temple. Um, so it, on one hand, it indicates the, um, the status of temple to a city. Um, it is significant, not just because it is the um, religious center, but also because it's crucial for the urban life um, for those early cities. Now, next example um, comes like a thousand year after the Uruk ziggurat. And this is the uh, great ziggurat at Ur. Um, <clears throat> so this one, again, partially survived. Um, the top layer is totally gone, but originally it got three layers of platforms, just like Papaje. It got three layers, and then on top, on the on top of the top layer is a temple. So it's kind of three layers plus plus a temple. Compared to um, the Uruk ziggurat, the ziggurat at Ur is very symmetrical. It featured a symmetrical facade facing the open space. And that symmetry, symmetry was strengthened by a central kind of flight of staircase leading from the ground to, um, to the first layer. And it continued, continued to the second um, and third layer. And then on either side, symmetrical um, staircase um, kind of attached to the wall of the first layer um, kind of converge at a central pavilion right there. So it, the, it became much more uh, formal and the symmetry was a great consideration in the design of this, of this building. The purpose is to present a monumental facade, present a monumental face for the celebration going on in front of it. So <clears throat> um, this is also the, this was built by Ur Namu uh, the founder of the third dynasty, third Sumerian dynasty. And uh, this is also the place where um, the stele for Urnamu was, was discovered. And the stele of Urnamu was the, um, the earliest documented um, legal uh, inscription uh, discovered. So this is the earliest law, um, basically. And it is about um, two centuries earlier than the famous code of Hammurabi, than the Babylonian um, code. So, so here we have kind of, um, we, we find the message, it's slightly changed compared to, um, to the previous relationship between the king and the, um, and the god. Now here we have the image of, of God, um, directly authorizing, authorizing the king to rule. Um, the inscription read, Ur Namu, the king of Ur, who built the temple um, of Nana. Nana is the, the, the god of moon, um, who is a very uh, significant uh, deity in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, <clears throat> the authority of the king is enhanced by claiming a special relationship with the god as his, as his, um, his direct servant. Um, so the, the basic relationship is still, you know, the king serve the god, but um, the images showing that he was authorized um, directly by, by, the, uh, by the moon god. The symmetry of 
the ziggurat of Ur is understandable if we consider its um, um, urban context. So if you, um, the, the, uh, the ziggurat of Ur is located, you know, in the, um, uh, in the heart of the, of the city. Um, the city of Ur was excavated, completely excavated, is preserved very well um, in the desert environment. Um, so the, the border of the city was irregular, almost in the kind of heart shape, uh, very organic. And uh, in the central northern area is the inner city. Um, that inner city is the headquarter. It combined the temple um, complex with the palatial complex. Um, so that enclosure. And the ziggurat got its own enclosure. So it has a huge courtyard and facing an empty ground. And that empty, empty ground was the um, uh, place for um, festival and celebration. Um, let's take a look at the, um, um, the city itself, uh, the inner city itself. The inner city, we have the ziggurat, which got its own um, enclosure attached to a temple, and that is like performing the um, additional function for the temple. There were storage, there were, there were um, uh, workshops, and, um, and then there is the, um, the residence, the palace for the priest, which is closer to the temple enclosure. And then the king's palace is you know, standing slightly in distance to the religious headquarter. But all of them are enclosed within the inner city. So from this relationship, we might um, interpret still, you know, the, you know, both the priests and the kings were servant to their God, but the king's um, palace is not, is not bigger uh, than the priest, priest class. And um, um, so the relationship was um, still, um, you know, the kind of a, uh, uh, the, the king was not claiming as, you know, the uh, divine status um, for themselves, which is about to, to change. So in architecture, um, we can understand the relationship um, of these kind of the uh, different um, aristocracy, the priests, the kings, and their relationship to their to their god. Um, <clears throat> so, I think I'm going to move a bit faster. Um, so you should be able to read this information if you if you need. Um, I'm not going to repeat those information that um, were already covered in your reading, um, but just pointed to a few. Um, key point. Um, you know, we have discussed in the Neolithic period different functions of architecture combined in the same place. This is still pretty much true for early Mes Mesopotamian um, architecture. For example, here, this is within the city, but the, uh, the tomb complex is also um, with, uh, in part of the enclosure. Uh, so the tombs for the kings was at a corner of this enclosure and not very far from the, uh, uh, the palace for, for the king. Um, and um, like the temple of Kafashe, those different courtyards provide um, space for workshops and archives, granaries, um, uh, Etc. So it is simultaneously a religious center, a business center, a administra administration center, and um, um, a ceremonial center. So that this is the uh, um, the neural kind of center of the of the whole city. And they are also geometric and compared to the organic shape of the city, and uh, the geometry. Um, was a huge contrast. It is also spacious. There were a lot of empty space. 
plenty of space for the appreciation of grand facade of the ziggurat, um, which is also a huge contrast to the general um, urban fabric. So when we zoom into the urban fabric, we notice that the house for common, um, common folks are not significantly um, different from some of the Neolithic settlement. Um, houses are one next to the other and there were, the alleys are pretty narrow. Um, and um, there were um, some bigger streets and a smaller, um, smaller streets, um, you know, dividing uh, the urban fabric into uh, different uh, sectors. Um, but there is a lack of monumental space in the city in general. Um, the rest of the city were pretty much generic, pretty, pretty much um, homogenous, um, creating a huge contrast to the uh, ceremonial center. Um, <clears throat> further zoom into the residential quarters, we notice that all the houses are oriented toward a central courtyard. So none of the walls facing the street um, have windows. They are all windowless. There's no windows on the exterior wall. All the windows and the doors open to the central courtyard. So the central courtyard is the, um, the uh, organizing, connecting space for each house good. And uh, open to the street um, is just the doorway, uh, which took a bend into the central courtyard so that standing on the street, you won't be able to see what is going on in the, in the courtyard uh, directly. So you have to make a turn to enter it. And then the central courtyard provide uh, ventilation, provide the source of light for all those different rooms. So it's, it's that kind of a, um, organization. And uh, contrary to the, um, um, the central quarters, here, there was no uh, aesthetic refinement for those exterior walls. Um, and um, um, there were also, you know, basically um, mud brick uh, construction. Uh, there, was, there was no ceramic tile to, um, to decorate or buttresses. So those were reserved for um, aristocratic uh, complexes. Um, <clears throat> Again, kind of like um, Neolithic Hatao Huyuk, in the city, um, there is no kind of a secondary church or secondary temples. It seems like the ziggurat is the only monumental temple for the whole city. And um, um, each household, on the other hand, had their own um, kind of religious centers, kind of like Hatao Huyuk. Um, and the, the uh, central ziggurat was probably reserved for the, um, for the king and the priests and aristocratic uh, families, while the, for the common folks, they worship, worship in their own household. So in the city in general, uh, numerous small figurines, which were identified as their god featuring big eye and long beard. This is the signature of, of the Mesopotamian god. Um, were found in every household. So it seems like uh, each family just worship in their own home, just like those families at Katao Huyuk. Um, <clears throat> the next example, you know, I, um, I think I'm going to skip this one just to point out, um, this is from the uh, Ishtali uh, from 1700 BCE. So I'm just using this example to to um, kind of make a transition to the later, later examples. So this one is from the Babylonian period, already from the Babylonian period. This is the temple of Ishtar. Um, the temple of Ishtar, the Ishtar as a god was especially significant for, for the Babylonians. Um, this is true for the old Babylonians. This is also true for the new Babylonians. So the, the uh, Ishtar is the goddess of fertility, warfare, and um, uh, sexuality. 
So um, it features courtyard, kind of like the Cafage Ovo uh, temple. It got courtyards, it got surrounding rooms for different, um, different facility. Um, and then each uh, courtyard, you know, when you walk through the space, um, the deeper you go inside, the more elevated the ground is. So it's still pretty much a spatial concept of the ziggurat. Um, so you ascend from the street to the first platform, enter the first courtyard, and then you enter the second courtyard, you need to ascend another platform. But the difference is, this, in this case, there, it is not a direct um, straight axis connection. It is a bend axis. So you, you go and you need to make a um, 90 degree turn to ascend to the second layer and then make another turn to face the main temple um, elevated on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the platform. Um, and then the temple itself got its own private access as well which is you know, for the priests and also to access their office, uh, which is there. So there is a differentiation of more public areas and a more private um, areas in this space. So the spatial division is slightly more complicated in, in comparison to the, um, to the Kafa shape. This is from the, Neo, um, Neo, uh, from the Babylonian period where you know, the famous Hammurabi's code had been had been discovered. And that Hammurabi's code is basically, um, you know, the eye for eye, um, that kind of, you know, it, it, if you are of equal status, you harm the other person and then you need to be, to be harmed. Um, and if you har harm your, your slave and then a, a, a lighter um, retribution um, might be applied to, to yourself. Um, so I'm going to give you, instead of five minutes, I'm going to just give you like two minutes break um, so 